All right, everybody, welcome back. It's part two of Minesweeper. It's Brian Fleischman. We're in Apple Lab. If you missed part one, why don't you go back and go ahead and find that. We In part one, let's take a look, just to kind of reacquaint ourselves with the project. We successfully created this grid of boxes, and we also hid some bombs uh, and collected all the IDs of the bomb locations in a little list, and we can count them. So you may notice that, like, if I run it this time, there are 57 bombs. And if I run it again, there are 45 bombs. Okay, I'm okay with that. If you don't like that, um, you can go ahead and, and maybe place the bombs in a different way. That's like, so there's always going to be 50 bombs or whatever. That'll be your challenge. How about that? If you're up for it, right? Otherwise, just follow me and be okay with a random amount of bombs that will fall in a reasonable range. Um, I think it'll be fine, all right? So I think what we should do next is probably, I think our goal for this video would be to get these boxes responding to a click. Um, so first maybe we'll just try to get them to respond in some way like they'll change color. Then maybe we'll get them to respond based on whether they're a bomb or how many they're touching. As far as that like sprawling activity that you notice in Minecraft, I was gonna say Minecraft, in Minesweeper, when you click on an empty space, it kind of like sprawls out and you can see a whole region get revealed. We won't do that in this video, but at least let's get these boxes um, reacting and we'll do that sort of sprawling behavior in the next video because that's going to take a little while. Okay, let's go. So I suppose if I want these boxes to respond to a click, I could make well, hundreds of different on event functions and load up all that code, but that doesn't seem very efficient, right? So if you suppose that's probably inefficient, there's got to be a better way. Let's just ask the screen to listen for a click. Let's uh, How about that? We'll ask the entire screen to listen for a click, and based on the location of the click, we'll be able to know which box we must be on because we can find out the X and Y location of the click. Okay, let's get into it so we can kind of see what I mean, all right? So if you've made an on event function before, it looks like this. So on the event that the screen gets clicked, so hopefully you've made these before, and if you haven't made these before, well, uh, just kind of write down what you see, or, and maybe, you know, I'd recommend maybe a simpler project to start with. On event functions, are, I'm not going to kind of go into how they work too much, because I suppose that you're kind of more advanced if you're looking how to make Minesweeper. Okay, how about this? Let's Let's check on, let's make sure that we are seeing the location of this click. So if you remember, you can ask the event for the X position of the click, and we can ask the event for the Y position of the click. Let's just kind of look and just make sure that, uh, that this is working. Okay, on the event that the screen gets clicked, I'd like to kind of print the coordinates. Um, and I don't want to, you know, those bombs, I'm not really interested in seeing those anymore right now. So let's just kind of comment those out. We might want to see it later. All right, let's see. So when I click here, um, 11 comma 64, I guess that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of getting my, it's getting my location of the click in a really, really particular way. So we must be able to use the information about the location of the click to determine which row and which column we're in, right? So which row we're in kind of depends on the Y value that of my click. Which column we're in depends on the X value. I'll be able to mathematically calculate that. And once I know the row and column, then I know the ID of the box I want to talk to because that's how I designed the ID. It stores the row and column within its ID, right? So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and, and give this a try. Okay, so let's talk about the X value. Let's store that real quick. So var x will be event.x. Var y will be event.y. Next, we need to calculate the row. Okay, so let's think about this. So if I'm between 0 and 20, I'm in, sorry, let's do, uh, mm, let's do column, why not? If I'm between 0 and 20 for my x, I'm in column 0. If I'm between 20 and 40, I'm in column 1. Next, increment of 20, I'm in column 2, and so on and so on. So how am I doing that, basically? Like, what would you do? I guess what I would try to do is I would try to divide the x coordinate by 20, right? But then I only want to take the whole number component of that. So like if I do 14, say, look at where my mouse is right now, 14 divided by 20, well, that's 0. Point blah, 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 right? So I'm 0. 0.7 or something like that, right? So 
I only care about the zero part of it. That's what's going to tell me that I'm in row zero. Now come over here, by the way, to like say 34 or something like that. If I click here, I must be in column one. That's because when I divide 34 by 20, I get one point something like 1.7. But I but the one is what I'm interested in. That's so the information for the column is in the X. It has something to do with just shaving off the decimal of the division answer, right? So here's how you do that. You go like this. So the column that I'm in is the math.floor. Whoa, what? What is this? Math.floor. Math.floor of the X divided by 20. Okay? So for example, let's just test this. Let me make sure you get what I'm talking about here. Call. Excuse me, not, not row, but call. So let's actually, let's just print the column that I must be clicking. Uh, let's see if this works. Column zero. Yep, it knows. What about column, say, one, two, three, four? Does it know it's column four? Look at that. It's working. So it's basically getting the decimalized division that you get out of x divided by 20, and then you take math.floor, just shaves off the decimal. No matter how close it is to the next number, like even if you're at 3.9999, I mean math.floor, it'll just shave off those 0.99s and give you three, right? So it's a little bit how, how division works in, in another programming language like Java or something like that. The final column is column 15. This looks like it's making perfect sense, okay? So this is how it works. This is how we determine which column we're in. We're going to do the row in much the same way, except for we have to keep in mind that we have 50 to account for. So the row must be the math.floor. Let's think about this for a second before we write down anything. <sighs> to be in row number one, I need to be between 50 and 70. Oh, man. So I'm still going to be dividing by 20, right? But maybe I should subtract 50 off of my Y value first before I calculate it, right? So let's say I'm at 53. I know I'm in row zero. I'm in that first row. I'm in row zero. But if I do like 53 and I subtract the 50, that'll be like three divided by 20, which will get me zero point something, right? So I do have to account for that 50 that I already start at. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it's the y minus 50, that divided by 20. And I should probably put the y minus 50 in parentheses because of the order of operations. So the only reason we have to do minus 50 here is because there's this offset from the beginning, right? We decided that the, the grid is going to start 50 down. So we have to kind of account for that in the calculation of what row we're in. All right. So now that I know which row and which column, let's actually see if we can talk to this uh, talk to this box here. Let's do it. So the, if I know the row and the column, then I know the ID. So let's construct this ID. It is row, isn't it? Whatever row we just calculated plus a dash plus the column, right? So I can find out which ID I'm interested in. Let's see if this works. So let's set property, for example. Let's see if we can get this thing to turn red. Let's set property of ID, background color, to red. Okay, take a look at the syntax there. The ID I calculated based on the row and column, which I calculated by the position of the click. So we should be having boxes turn red. So it's going to look like they're all bombs, but they're responding properly, right? And even if I click over here, it doesn't break the program. Do you see that? If I click off of the grid, it doesn't break the program. It just doesn't, there's, it just tries to change the property of some, some place that doesn't exist, and it's fine. It doesn't break the program, so that's nice to know. So there we go. Kind of looks like they're all bombs, but really all we're doing is seeing if our click mechanism works, and it does. So, so far, so good. Let's clear the console. Okay, so that's not what I want to do. I don't want to turn everything red. What I have to do at this point is I have to figure out what's going on here. I have to reveal the box. So, like, I think it's going to be pretty complex because it might say the number one. It might say the number four or three. I have to kind of, like, do some some scanning around this box to figure out what number I need to place in it. Okay, so I'm actually, at this point, I'm going to make a new function called reveal box. And I think uh, the, based on which row and column it's in. So there's gonna be a lot of logic in here in reveal box. So I don't really want to write it all in here. So I'm gonna write it somewhere else. I'm gonna write reveal, I'm gonna, I'd like to reveal the box, okay? Um, and I usually like to, by the way, I like to have my on event functions kind of last, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to write this reveal box function before this on event function. And that's just a matter of style. It's not like required for making this thing works. Reveal box 
and I need the parameters row call. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so revealing the box, if we really want to not just turn it red, I think it'd be more interesting to kind of calculate what, like, how many bombs are around it. Wouldn't you agree? So let's do this. Let's keep track of how many bombs are around it. How about, let's say, adjacent bombs. So far, I have none, but we're going to go search for them. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Let's see here. So let's say this one, for example, right? This box that I'm at right now. I have to search above me, like all of these rows above me for a bomb. I have to search this row for a bomb, and I have to search this bottom row of below me for a bomb. So it's like it's like a little a little grid search, right? So I'm like searching through a grid to see if it's a bomb. Okay, so it's like a I think a nested for loop would be great here because I'm doing like rows and columns, right? So let's do this. Let's let's make a little nested for loop. For well, where do I want to begin? Which row do I want to begin on? For of our row, I want to begin on the row. Uh, how about, I can't use row again. I don't want to do that, right? That's bad. So actually, let's use a more traditional I. How about that? Um, I want to begin on the previous row. Remember the row above me. Um, and I want to go until, until the next row after me. So less, as long as row is less than or equal to, or as long as I is less than or equal to row plus one. Right, so I'm beginning, let's just take a look at this. I'm beginning on the row above me, and I'm going to go as long as uh, the row below me. Right? And I'll say I++ plus plus to increase the row when I'm done with the current row. Uh, within each row, I would like to check columns. So var j equals, uh, and how do I check, say, the previous column? It's going to be a very similar structure. I want to check to the column to the left and then proceed until j is less than or equal to the column to my right. Or as long as, I want to proceed as long as j is less than or equal to the column to my right, and then move over when you're ready. So, okay, so this is just a nested for loop structure that crawls, that crawls kind of around the box. Okay, so notice here, the way I, I program this is that it's going to check to see whether itself is a bomb, right? Okay, so here's the deal. I don't really care about that right now because I know that I'm gonna handle that special case of when you click a bomb later, right? So if I click a bomb, I'm not going to get to reveal box. I'm going to get to something else like a game over. So the fact that this checks itself to see if it's a bomb doesn't bother me at all. So if it's anything other than a bomb, it won't find anything on itself. So it's just going to really what's important is that it's going to look around it. Okay. So let's see. Let's ask at this position. I wonder if there's a bomb at location IJ. Right. So if. So what ID am I talking about? It's like, you know, um, this so I will encode the row and J will encode the column. So the so the ID that I'm going to ask about is I dash J, right? So it's like row dash call, right? Because I dash J is simply just another name for the row and column. So what I'd like to do is ask bombs. Hey bombs, do you have this I dash J? So here's how I'm going to ask bombs. I'm going to say, can you tell me the index of I? plus a dash, plus a J. Space these out for readability. Okay, so here's how index of works if you didn't know that. If it can find it, it'll have a number for me. It'll be like, oh yeah, I have it. It's in, I got the 10th thing in my list, I got it. Or it's the 20th thing, I got it, right? So the index of will bring us back a number. But if it does not find it, it brings us back the number negative one, which means there's no number. So how about this, if the index of this is not negative one, this is what I'm going to say. That means if it's not negative one, meaning you did find it, then what I'd like to do is increase my bombs count. Adjacent bombs plus plus. Okay? So essentially, it's going to ask the bombs, hey, can you tell me the index of this I dash J thing? And it's like, yeah, it's 20. Oh, it's not negative one, so I need to add one to the bombs. But if it is indeed negative one, it's meaning like, nope, I couldn't find it, then I will not add a bomb, right? So I'm adding adjacent bombs, and this is going to go crawl around this box and check for how many bombs it can find. It'll also check itself, inconsequential, as I explained earlier, because if it really is a bomb itself, we'll do a game over or something earlier than we'll get here. Okay. Um, next, what should we do? 
Okay, so isn't the number of adjacent bombs, isn't that um, the number that we want to see on the, on, the, on the box itself? So let's actually test this real quick. Let's set the property of the, of the text box real quick. Set property of ID. Oh, no. The, uh, the ID of this box, remember, is row-call. Mm, okay, so let's actually, you know, let's actually make that real quick, just real, just real quick. Because I've always done it this way, row plus a dash plus, plus a call. Okay, so I've always done that. So set property of the ID. Uh, let's set the, oh, it's not the set the property. Actually, I want to set the text, don't I? Let's set text. Let's set the text of ID to... What is it? Well, if it's the adjacent bombs is two, then I want to see a two. It's really, I just want to see the adjacent bombs, the number, that literal number in the box. Okay? So, let's give this a try. So, we might see some bombs like around and some of them might say zero and some of them might say one, but let's just see if this system is working. All right, let's, let's run this. Okay, so I should start seeing some numbers here. No bombs around me here. There's one bomb around me here. Right, so this appears to be working. Like one bomb around all of these. Zero. Let's see if we can find a more interesting number than zero and one. Make sure this thing's good to go. Yeah, there's three. It looks like it's working, right? It looks like it's going to count the bombs. And as far as where these bombs are, some of these that I'm clicking on probably are bombs, by the way, right? So uh, let's, let's assume that this is working for now. Okay, let's let's just let's try this. Let's go ahead and try to also set the color, right? Isn't that kind of interesting? Like so I think in Minesweeper, like the if if you, if you get a one for adjacent bombs, it's gonna be blue. If you get a two for adjacent bombs, it's gonna be like green or something, or uh, green, yeah, for twos, and then red for threes. So let's actually come up with a list of colors that we could that we could uh, do here. How about this? Let's do this right below the bombs. Let's make um, a list of colors. I'm not really interested in index zero because I'm not going to see anything there. So I'm going to leave a blank color there for when I find zero bombs. Uh, when I find one bomb, I want to see blue. And when I find two bombs, I think it's green. Is that right? Not green. Uh, and then it's red. And then I guess I got to come up with like, gosh, up to what, eight? Eight different colors because it's possible that something could be right in the middle of like a Surrounded by bombs. Red, blue, green. Let's see, blue, green, red. I don't know. Uh, how about yellow? I don't really know how these colors go. If you want to go be like really pure to the mine sweeper um, tradition, go find out what these are. I need to come up with some more colors. Orange. Red. I already used red. Orange. Yeah. Brown. One, two, three, four. So I'm counting blue, green, red, yellow. So I need two more. Brown, um, purple. Am I miss? Is there another color out there? Blue, green, red, yellow, orange, brown, purple. Jeez. Uh, Let's do uh, white. Let's go crazy with it. I don't know. So that's very rare. We probably won't see that, right? The fact that something's going to be click. We're going to click right in the middle of a circle of bombs. Almost impossible. Okay. So let's take a look. Now that we have the number of adjacent bombs, look at how it's lined up with it, right? So this is like when you have one bomb, two bombs near you, three, right? So we can set the color to some index of this colors list. And the index is the number of adjacent bombs. So let's do this. Set color, or set property, I'm sorry. Set property um, of ID. I think it's called text, yeah, text color. To, well, it's going to be, I don't know what it is, it's going to be, it's going to come from the colors list, and which index? Well, it depends on how many bombs, right? So I'm going to grab this. So if I, if this happens to be one, it will set it to blue. As you remember, that's what that was in the list of that position, right? So let's take a look. So I should now get numbers and colors. Ooh, a blue number one, some you know gray number zeros, they're kind of boring. A green number two, this is looking pretty good. So if, but you know, one thing I notice as well is that like, is that I don't see, um, it kind of looks like they're still the same color. Like there's, there should be a deeper gray when I press them. So let's actually do that as well. 
So let's set the set the property for the background color ID background color and let's set it to a little bit deeper of a gray. I'm going to say hashtag b b b b b six b's. Remember that the original color I think was like d d d d, which is like almost white, and this is a little bit further away from right white b b b b b. So a little bit of hex nerddom there. So there you go. Now it's looking like numbers are showing up. There are no bombs. So it's kind of counting the number of bombs that are around each other. But the funny thing is we're not seeing a bomb. So let's actually get to the point where we can see the bombs. How I don't know how long this video is, but I think we should probably stop after we detect bombs. Okay, let's stop after we detect bombs and then we'll, we'll do a part three after that. But we're getting there. Ooh, a four. That's interesting. It looks nice with the yellow. I like it. I like it. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. No semicolon and the program didn't die. Well, why do you need them then, JavaScript? Okay, um, what did I do? Okay, so let's actually, so here we are back in the click function. Let's, let's try to figure out if indeed we've, we've clicked on a bomb and then we'll do something different if we clicked on a bomb, right? So for example, like if we, if we click on, on a bomb, then I probably don't want to go reveal the box. I want to do something different. So let's do this. How about let's just let's calculate this. So once we have the ID, let's say this. If you remember how we asked the bombs array if it has it or not. So if bombs dot index of the ID that I just calculated does not happen to be negative or it is yeah it does not happen happen to be negative one. That means it must have found that it was a bomb. Then what I want to do is let's for now let's say this set set we're going to set this square to being red. It'll be fun. Set the property of the ID, the background color, to be to be red. Right? I'm kind of going a little bit fast, but I'm I think we're doing okay. So hey, go look for a hey, bombs. This is by the way back in the click function, in case you can't tell. After I calculate the ID, so if hey hey bombs, if you find this ID in you, I would rather do this thing of setting the background color to red. Otherwise, I should probably have an else here. I want to reveal that box. Perfect. Okay, so it's only going to reveal the box with the number in it if it's not a bomb. If it's a bomb, it should just turn it red. So this should behave a little bit differently now. Um, there is a bomb, bam, right off the bat. So does this thing really touch two bombs? Let's look. So now we can investigate if our function worked. That really does look like it touches two bombs, doesn't it? All right, so look at this number one. That one must be the only bomb it touches. So let's look around it and see if it really did Right? Yeah, it looks like it worked, right? And so this, look, you, you can almost play a little bit. This must be a bomb, right? Yep, it is. This one's already touching two, so these must not be bombs. Look, we're actually kind of playing now. Now, the interesting thing is when we click on these zeros, right, something else should happen, right? We shouldn't see zero because you don't see zero in, in Minesweeper. You see that sort of expandy sort of like, brr, like the region sort of like appears. I think that's the topic of the next video. But right now we are definitely detecting the bombs and the, the boxes themselves are accurately counting how many bombs are around them and they are accurately placing the number inside of them and, and we're actually getting kind of close, right? So maybe two or three more videos, I think we can have a working version of this game. Um, until then, oh, look at this as a fiver. I haven't seen a five in a long time. I actually don't like the orange very much, but maybe we can fix that another time. So there we go. We're getting there. Uh, this is part two of Minesweeper. If you want to go ahead and move on to part three, that should be up pretty soon. Um, and we'll learn how to sprawl this board out and, and get those regions of empty space filled in. All right. Hope you're having fun. I hope you're learning. Um, be ready for a big time challenge in the next video. All right. Talk to you guys soon.